Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of water to cover with some really interesting content, so I want to get us going. Welcome to the second in the Connex Tech Prize webinar series, where we are going to examine some of the tools that you can use to take apart a really large complex problem and turn it into something fundamentally unique and hopefully something that you can submit to the Connex Tech Prize. So this is called How to Solve a Problem Like, and we're joined by Alex Dagan from Conservation X Labs and Dr. Nikki Couture from the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon. I'd like to just quickly introduce both of those. Uh, Nikki is professor and Cooper Siegel chair in the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. His research on crowd augmented cognition looks at how we can augment the human intellect using crowds and computation. He has authored and co-authored more than 70 peer-reviewed papers, 14 of which have received best paper awards or honorable mentions. Dr. Couture is a Kavli Fellow, has received an NSF Career Award, the Allen Newell Award for Research Excellence, major research grants from NSF, NIH, Google, and Microsoft, and his work has been reported in venues including Nature News, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, NPR, Slashdot, and The Chronicle of Higher Education. He received a BA in psychology and computer science at Princeton and a PhD in cognitive psychology from UCLA. Dr. Alex Dagan is the CEO of Conservation X Labs, an innovation and technology startup focused on conservation. He also acts as the Chandler Innovator at Duke University and is a professor, at, professor of the practice at Arizona State University. Most recently, Alex served as the chief, chief scientist at the US Agency for International Development with rank of assistant administrator. After founding and heading the Office of Science and Technology, he created the vision for and helped launch the Global Development Lab, the agency's DARPA for development, and was part of the founding team of USAID's Policy Bureau. Prior to USAID, Alex worked in multiple positions at the Department of State, including overseas service under the Coalition Provisional Authority, using science to support bilateral diplomacy. Alex was the founding country director of the Wildlife Conservation Society Afghanistan program and helped create Afghanistan's first national park, which is the topic of his recently published book, The Snow Leopard Project. Alex holds a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Chicago. What we wanna do with this webinar is take an opportunity to talk not specifically about invasive species, which is the topic of the Connex Tech Prize, but to talk in a more abstract way about how to find opportunities within large problems themselves, and then how to ideate and develop new, unique, and innovative solutions to some of those problems that are an opportunity to go forward and to really revolutionize the field. It can seem really opaque when you're looking at an enormous challenge and it can seem very hard to break into, but there are tools that we're gonna give you today that will allow you to take that problem apart into smaller parts and then approach those in different ways so you can find areas of opportunity to look into other fields and pull in some examples from them and come up with solutions that will really revolutionize what we're hoping in conservation and invasive species. So first I'm gonna pass this to Dr. Alex Dagan and he is going to send us through some of his ideas on solving wicked problems. Alex, I'm passing you the remote control mouse. Awesome, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Sure can. Awesome, uh, first it's really an honor to have Nikki here. Uh, he's literally one of the world's leaders in the practice and thinking of innovation. Uh, so we're really lucky to have him. Uh, the work I'm gonna be talking about is really this idea of how do you solve these, these wicked problems um, and what it, how do we approach it at Conservation X Labs, how we approached it at the Global Development Lab at USAID. Uh, and then I'm gonna see how we advance these. Um, so the, the first question is really, you know, do you fundamentally understand the problem and are you solving the right problem uh, that you are taking on? And also the question of this question of whether you're solving the problem is whether what is the impact of what you're trying to solve. So there can be multiple constraints that you are actually that are 
impeding the solution to a particular problem. Uh, understanding which of those constraints, if solved, could lead to a transformative breakthrough is kind of your goal. Uh, and this question of impact, it's people generally don't want to just solve problems or elements of a problem that won't have a huge impact in terms of what you're doing. So understanding the opportunity, understanding how big the problem is, uh, understanding which of the constraints by taking a systems approach to mapping out the space by reframing the problem itself is, is, is really important. And this process is one thing we went through, for instance, uh, by looking at, you know, what are the grand challenges within the water and conservation space? We actually looked at mapping the problem space uh, and looking at that mapping of all challenges within the water and conservation space, uh, whether it is by, you know, what is the competitive landscape? What is the barriers to the solution? What is the readiness of the technologies for being able to address it? Uh, what ways could we rethink uh, how we solve those particular problems? Um, and then what are the gaps in knowledge, capability, barriers, assumptions, uh, bottlenecks that need to be overcome to achieve that transformative breakthrough? Um, and which of those constraints, as I mentioned, have the highest impact? So one example from USAID was the very first grand challenge we did was called Saving Lives at Birth. Uh, it was about addressing maternal child care, particularly from the onset of, de of, of, of um, de you know, the, the, pregnant, the birth process to 48 hours after delivery. And one of the things we recognized was that there wasn't enough money in not just at USAID, which is $20 billion a year, but across all the development agencies uh, to be able to, to provide everyone with hospitals that are fully equipped with well-trained personnel. So if you took those constraints away, our assumptions were we needed those things. But if you took those constraints away, the thought was, how do we provide the same level of care to someone, whether in a hospital or a hut? And so the types of innovations we got were ones that essentially allowed us to, to leapfrog the idea of a hospital, of a well-trained personnel, of, of the types of equipment that we needed, and do delivery to people in the last mile. And that's how you take this approach. And the question I ask is, where are there opportunities to leapfrog solutions to the invasive species problems that we have? And the ways we can think about innovation is there is, uh, there is a lot of different ways that you can actually uh, innovate. You can innovate on the profit model, the configuration, the structure of the process. You can innovate on the product itself and the performance of a product um, or even the system in which the product is embedded with. The innovation itself may be one that is a service innovation. It may be the channel. It may be even how you have your brand. It may be how you do customer engagement. Uh, and, and companies like Zappos, like, like Netflix, like Tesla, have all sort of done this type of innovation. We're really familiar with these models. The question is, how do we actually apply this type of innovation to conservation? Um, and again, this idea of where you rethink assumptions. Uh, one of my favorite other examples is New Wave Foods. So we know with shrimp, for instance, for every pound of shrimp that you have uh, that you collect in the wild, uh, there's 20 pounds of bycatch that are thrown away. Uh, we also know that there are problems with farming shrimp uh, within aquaculture, within ponds on land that lead to heavily amounts of pollution, that lead to things like antibiotics. Uh, and the shrimp industry itself has led to things like slavery uh, and human trafficking. Uh, New Wave Foods have this idea of why are we why are we growing why are we using living animals for shrimp? Uh, they used red algae to create shrimp that was now uh, free of slavery, free of bycatch, and now even uh, vegan and kosher uh, within the model. So this is one of the ways to rethink the assumptions. Can we actually replace? the products that are driving species extinct? Can we think of new ways of how we're addressing something? If we're spending huge amounts of money to try to solve a problem, is there a way that we can, we can think about that? Another great example is a company that uh, three of my friends founded called Planet Labs. Uh, and they, they were all at NASA and they recognized that how we actually put 
uh, a satellite into space. It was the last Landsat, I think Landsat 8, right? Co took 10 years and cost something like $950 million. And by the time you put something that expensive into space, you wanna make sure every piece on technology on it works. So at the beginning of the process, all the technology had to be space certified and was frozen, right? And so uh, the, by the day the satellite went into space, it was 10 years out of date. Uh, Planet Labs and you know, 950 million to put in the space, Planet Labs recognized with $40,000 satellites using consumer technology, right? Not bespoke technology. Uh, uh, and essentially that cost $17,000 to put in this space. They could create a constellation of 150 satellites that, that ring the earth. And that uh, instead of taking a picture every 14 days as Landsat does, they could take a picture every day, everywhere of the entire planet at an order and magnitude better resolution, uh, what is three meters rather than 30 meters. So it was a way of fundamentally rethinking the assumptions about that we need bespoke technology, that we need expensive satellites. But the real difference is those satellites, they're so cheap to put in the orbit, but they're also in low Earth orbit. They fall out of space every, every few years, every three years. Every new satellite goes up actually has better technology. So while Landsat 8 is aging, the, new, the, the Planet Lab system is actually improving in its, its technology. You can think about where you can harness leverage. Uh, iNaturalist, for instance, has used both um, citizen science as a way of greatly improving our ability to survey the Earth. Uh, but recently, they've started to use, and they use curation, a system of experts to improve and ensure the quality of what they're doing. And this was a system developed by Scott Laurie. Uh, it's supported by National Geographic and Cal Academies. Uh, but there's been another company called Wild Me that has done something similar around whale sharks. Uh, the original number of whale sharks around the world was something like 300 that were known to science. Uh, Wild Me came along and started using the pattern of, shark, of spots in the back of the sharks and the system of recreational divers and dive masters to start taking pictures of those sharks, uh, identifying individual whales, loading it up to a database, uh, and identifying sharks. Then most, re and they got that number up to 3,000. And then they started actually using tools to uh, scope YouTube videos, uh, look for sharks in those videos, use bots to actually query the poster about metadata around those sharks. And they now are tracking 10,000 sharks, uh, individual sharks, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year with a team of six people. So the ability to have a transformational uh, effect on science is huge if we rethink it. And then we can think about behavioral tools, everything from incentives to rewards, the competition and gamification, knowledge gaps, which is what BuzzFeed does, social pressure and learning, fear, self-identity, uh, self-worth, significance, uh, as well as the fact that there is a problem, which tends to be the least effective tool to actually incentivize people to change as a tool of innovation within what we're trying to do. Uh, one great example of this was one of the major emerging areas of death in the developing world is car accidents. And an and a NGO realized by literally changing the social dynamic within uh, Matutus, these um, small buses that are used for transportation around East Africa, and encouraging people to speak up and tell the driver to slow down, uh, through just simple stickers that people could stick on the inside of the buses, they, they actually proved that they could reduce the number of traffic accidents uh, on the ground. Uh, design is a huge area for innovation. And one of the elements of it is this idea of frugal innovation. So, you know, we know that our ocean space, for instance, is a very, things tend to be over-engineered and way too expensive. So how do you actually design for the other 90% or the bottom of the pyramid and use things like cost, environment, education, rely on maintainability, making sure there isn't inadvertent effects, even the manufacturing process, distribution process, the cultural adaptation of what you're doing and the scale, which has to be built in at the beginning as a tool for thinking about innovation around what you're trying to do. Um, in conservation, we tend to focus on symptoms rather than understanding the underlying drivers. And this requires us to take a systems approach around the problems that we have. 
uh, and we need to do a lot more testing. So national parks are a great example of uh, an important tool and longstanding tool, something I've contributed to around the world in terms of building systems in national parks, but it doesn't actually address the pressures that are leading to, for instance, deforestation. And understanding of those pressures may be important. One great company that I love in the conservation space that is rethinking solutions was, was called, is Penvient. That's producing artificial rhino horns. And they originally went with this mythology in conservation that this was mainly driven for health reasons, uh, why people wanted rhino horn. What they found actually by doing research on the ground was the main reason was, uh, was, was for a carving market in Vietnam. And that was only after they actually went and did interviews with people that they realized that much of the demand for rhino horns was going for a carving market that was driven by wealth and not health for markets in China. Uh, and so there are ways to think about uh, how we solve these problems. Another one is really understanding who's paying the cost allows for great innovations. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, one of a guy named Ron Gonin, who now runs the Clo Closed Loop Foundation, who realized that, play that recycling facilities in New York were shutting down because no one was recycling. Um, he developed a company called Recycle Bank, and he made the case that we could actually, uh, we should be paying people to recycle. Uh, and by paying people was giving them Starbucks points, Target points, uh, incentives for people based on the amount they were recycling. And he had a simple system of RFID chips in garbage cans that would be weighed by the arm of the dump trucks that would actually pick them up, uh, and people would get points based on what they were doing. When the officials in the New York City area said, uh, this is not possible, um, we can't afford to do this, what he pointed out to individuals was that, that they were already paying the cost of this because every garbage truck unnecessarily filled with recycled material driving from New York City and the New York environments out to the middle of Pennsylvania and then paying dump fees, every extra garbage truck that was doing that was a place for, for using cost savings to actually fund this program. And they were able to bring recycling rates from 20% up to 90% as a result of this. Cost itself and how you think about cost is an opportunity for innovation. So when Unilever and other companies were selling uh, uh, laundry detergent, they realized that while people could not afford the cost of large bottles of laundry detergent, actually breaking it up into single use packets uh, was something for the market that they could take uh, into consideration around what they're doing. Um, another example is pay-as-you-go system, and the same thing was done by Graham Power, uh, a team that was developed out of Berkeley, by Berkeley undergrads who realized that uh, a lot of programs that just provided access to power in the developing world were failing. Uh, one of the challenges where we asked people to pay the cost of the infrastructure in the developing world or in the West, it's actually amortized through your individual payments to electricity over time. Uh, we don't ask people in the West to pay for the lines coming to their house in the first place, uh, not directly, and that they could develop pay-as-you-go cards that allowed individuals to rent things like solar panels and pay, pay for them with increments of electricity as, as a model. Finally, you know, there is this uh, intent to really understand demand. And I think this is one of the most important elements of, of thinking about how you address the problem. Uh, and my favorite expression is actually one from Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And it is this recognize, recognition that reality means you have to be adaptable in the innovation process in itself. And, and one thing is to recognize that one of your greatest sources of innovations are the hypotheses that you're making and the ability to really rethink them. Uh, and a lot of what we have at the beginning is the series of untested hypotheses. And my recommendation is uh, how do we actually ensure that the problem that we're solving is one that costs people real pain and understand what their or gives people a real benefit and understand what people are actually willing to pay for that, that benefit or that cost. Uh, and the failure to do so means that we end up burning cash, uh, losing money that could go to more impactful things, uh, and building, making an effort building stuff that no, no one really wants. And the way to get around it is really by testing our assumptions, uh, looking up the data, uh, interviewing people, 
uh, doing desk research, observing others, impersonating people, and co-creating and experimenting around the innovations that we have. And these processes give us insights uh, that we want. The last bit is to really be thinking about the unintended consequences uh, of what you're doing. And there's some great ones developed by Frank Corchamps at the University of Paris Sud, uh, which was recognizing that the very declaration of something as endangered actually increases demand for that product or for that animal. So the things like endangered species list, our media attention on animals that are going extinct has had two effects on things like climate change, the idea of the, of the polar bear on the floating ice flow actually may inadvertently deter people from wanting to solve the problem. The second is that, that you know, things like endangered species lists may actually increase demand for the very species that we're trying to protect. So understanding those unintended consequences, understanding how human behavior is part of any innovation is important for what you're trying to do. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nikki. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have the mouse now? Not quite yet. Nikki, I want to just jump in quickly. Did, um, can you all see my screen still? The, the PowerPoint? No, it seems to be gone for me. At least. Okay, no problem. I will quickly put that back up. And uh, I just wanted to uh, just wanted to quickly mention a couple of things before we jump over uh, to Nikki. One, thank you, Alex, so much. That was a really um, a really amazing overview of trying to truly dig into the problem space. I'll be summarizing that and posting that onto the digital makerspace after this and of course this is being recorded so uh, we'll be able to go back over this because we've got so much good content in here that we're moving moving through it rather quickly so i'll be summarizing those to post onto the dms afterwards and you'll have this video um, i also want to remind everybody that if you have questions as we go through then you can ask them down in the q a section and we'll take 10 minutes at the very end of this webinar to answer any individual uh, questions that you may have um, and in regards to thinking about the problem as well, we're thinking a lot about you know, how to frame it, how to take it apart. Uh, if you are looking for to really understand that problem, I'd recommend as well that you go back to the first webinar if you hadn't already seen it, which spent the, an hour really diving into the problem of invasive species. So we spent a lot of time really looking at islands and uh, invasives and threatened species and taking apart the ecology of invasives so that you can really understand the problem area, then this webinar is great to start to take it apart and look at opportunities to innovate. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Nikki. Nikki, I'm going to give you control of the mouse and then I'm going to go on mute. You should have it right now. Okay, fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm really honored to be uh, you know, part of this and this amazing cause that uh, you're all working towards. And what I'm going to try to do is to take some of the things that we've learned uh, and that have been learned more generally over the last, you know, 40, 50 years of looking at innovation uh, and analogy and try to boil that down into something that might be uh, digestible and bite-sized that might actually help with some of the uh, problems and projects that you're trying to uh, generate. And I think it'll build really nicely on top of what Alex talked about. Uh, not So once you've identified some of these interesting problems, how do you find solutions from different areas to help you come up with truly disruptive or innovative solutions? So <clears throat> let's see if I can... Okay, great. So, um, you know, if we think about innovation, we can actually start with one of uh, our own country's uh, innovators, Thomas Edison. A lot of people think about his quote about innovation being 99% uh, perspiration. But uh, another thing he said was that one of the most important uh, qualities of an inventor is a logical mind that sees analogies. And analogies are one of the things that has driven innovation in science and technology for thousands of years. So going back to uh, ancient Greeks, Chrysippus, who thought that sound waves 
uh, might act the same way that water waves did to understand sound. Or even in art with Leonardo da Vinci and uh, the proportions of the perfect man being echoed in Greek temples. Or more recently with innovators like the Wright brothers who actually use multiple analogies in order to get their, uh, you know, the first airplane to fly, including, for example, steering the plane of the, steering the plane by shearing the wings in the same way that uh, a cardboard inner tube box uh, might be sheared. More recently, we've seen analogy uh, really come out and become very democratized in terms of its effect on innovation. So uh, Alex was actually talking about one of the first contests that he put on. Uh, there was a, a fantastic example of this that uh, resulted from that contest. Uh, this is the Odon device made by a uh, Argentinian car mechanic who created a new method for removing a baby stuck in the birth canal that was inspired by actually a YouTube video uh, about a party trick for removing a cork from a wine bottle. And this is touted now uh, by the World Health Organization as, as a significant advance uh, in birthing technology. So now that we have access to many, many more analogies than we ever have before, you know, there are idea repositories, there's the patent database, there's YouTube videos, there's web pages, billions of potential analogies are out there. We could accelerate how quickly we can innovate and solve problems. And the, the one of the things preventing us, I think, from doing that is this idea that we all need to be kind of geniuses like Chrysippus, where you know there's this eureka moment and lightning strikes and suddenly you've solved this tremendously important problem. And you know, what we've really found over the last you know, 30, 40, 50 years is that analogy is not a, uh, it's not a lightning strike, it's not magic. In fact, it's a very repeatable, robust cognitive process that goes on in the mind. And it looks something like this. It's actually quite simple. What happens, you take a problem, you abstract it, so you generalize it, you sort of throw away the surface details, and that more abstract version of the problem allows you to search for interesting inspirations from very, very diverse domains, from all over, from YouTube videos to patents. And then it requires you to take that inspiration and apply it back to solving the original problem, which might not always be immediately obvious, but often leads to interesting results. And so what I'm going to take you through here is just a very quick uh, set of examples around how could you take this process and put it into action yourself. So the first piece that we're going to talk about is this uh, arrow going from the original problem to a more abstract uh, version of it. And the reason why we need to do that is because of fixation. And fixation is what happens when you see, you know, an original problem and you, you get boxed in by it. You just naturally, our brains do this automatically. There's actually no uh, easy way to get around this is that uh, our brains start associating with other things that are in the same domain. Uh, and that leads to, as you can see here, um, some things that might be intentional or unintentional conformity uh, homogenous ideas. So to come up with something truly innovative, the first thing you need to do is to break free from this box that your brain puts you into, right? And so uh, let's take, I'll, I'll just use as a running example, let's say we wanted to design a new kindergarten chair, a better kindergarten chair. Then if we just started with that, you know, design a new kindergarten chair, and we asked uh, nine, you know, 10 people to come up with uh, a new kindergarten chair, we might actually end up seeing things like this. So, you know, they all pretty much look like kindergarten chairs, maybe slightly different colors, uh, but these are really incremental innovations. So the question is, how do we move to more disruptive, um, you know, really interesting new innovations? And I'm going to give you four steps to do that. The first step is to take this original description, so coming up with a new kindergarten chair, and be 
concrete about what your purpose is. So there are a lot of different purposes for a kindergarten chair, right? It might need to be cleanable. It might need to be stackable. It might need to not pinch people's fingers. Uh, but picking one of those will allow you to focus in on a set on, of relations or a purpose that will allow you to search more effectively for ideas in other places. So here we have a new kindergarten chair that doesn't tip over, for example. The second is to be abstract about the object. So it doesn't really matter where you look. Uh, in fact, you don't want to be looking for other things that are like kindergarten chairs or like other chairs necessarily for inspirations because they're probably going to come up with ideas that have already been done before, right? And so here what we're doing is we're simply dropping out or we're abstracting this idea that the thing that we're trying to avoid tipping over is a kindergarten chair. So let's say that it's something that doesn't tip over. And so once we have this more abstract version of the problem, we can start looking in other places for solutions. Where, where would you look for things that don't tip over, right? And again, this is a little bit challenging for us to do, partly because our search engines aren't really built for this, partly because our brains aren't really built for this but there are a few tricks that we could use to try to do this. So, you know, as I'm speaking, you can probably think of a, a few areas yourself that place uh, for places that don't tip over. And that's a great way to start. Some things you could try to do are to focus on the verb. So let's say, you know, preventing tipping over. What if we search for prevent tip over? Well, already here you can see there are some things that might get you to spark an idea, whether it's uh, anchoring something onto something else. Uh, you know, you've, we've got forklifts tipping over, we've got pots being tipped over. How do we prevent them? Are there interesting solutions or mechanisms there? And the verbs turn out, you know, the prevent, the tipping, those turn out to be much more important and useful for finding inspirations than verbs, which often, than nouns like the kindergarten chair, which get you stuck in the domain that you were originally in. You can also look for antiverbs, look for the opposite of what you were trying to do. So where are places that things do tip over? Uh, kayaks, trucks, sailboats, right? Maybe there are places in those domains that'll give you interesting new ideas. A third place that we've uh, actually found in some of our research is quite effective is to start by getting people to think not of uh, objects, but of professions. So what are some jobs that would involve uh, requiring things, you know, avoiding tipping over? So maybe it's motorcycle drivers or tightrope walkers or, you know, again, forklift operators. And once you've identified these places that are very distant domains, you can start looking in them. So you can look for videos, you can look on the web, you can look for patents, you can, um, you know, you can talk to people in these areas and um, that will allow you to start collecting inspirations. And these inspirations might be, you know, if you're a forklift operator, maybe there's something about, uh, you know, changing the center of gravity, or maybe you come across a Weeble Wobble doll, and that suggests to you, oh, can I, uh, you know, could I change uh, the center of gravity downwards to make it less, uh, less wobbly, right? And so, those inspirations are going to then allow you to transfer back to the original problem domain. So just to be you know, specific, if we took that Weeble Wobble doll, there are actually uh, chairs now that have a rounded base and a heavily weighted base that allow uh, kids to sit on them and move around a little bit but not tip over, right? And these are actually being used for, for anti-fidgeting as an example. So um, there are places and ways to apply your inspiration. Doesn't have to, look at this, this doesn't exactly, these chairs don't look like Weeble Wobble dolls, right? But they're taking the mechanisms from that original inspiration and applying them in a way to this domain. Now, this is sometimes one of the places where people have the most trouble uh, once you've found inspirations, people will often throw them away, we found, uh, because they can't make that transition. And 
the important thing to do is to not just throw something away because it seems irrelevant. The important thing to do is to use these to explore, to unlock new design spaces for you to think through. Okay, they don't have to necessarily be directly applicable for them to be useful in making you more creative. So let's just take an example of how we might explore, right? We might move up and down levels of abstraction. We might move left and right and sideways in thinking of things. So here, here's just one example, right? So let's take one of our, uh, our finalist projects from a previous competition, Snapcat, which was trying to find an invasive species of feral cats using a camera trap, right? And using machine, le machine learning and computer vision to try to identify which of these things are feral. So are there other ways that we might be able to characterize the <clears throat> invasive species uh, that we're looking for, right? What, how could we unlock our mind for ways to do that? So let's apply our different steps. So first, let's think about what's the problem here? Well, maybe it's detecting feral cats using photos, okay? But again, let's be specific about that and abstract out the object. So maybe we can detect things. What about detecting things using photos? Or maybe we can be more abstract about photos. What about detecting things using their physical appearance? And, and once you've made this jump from photos to physical appearance, what else can you think of that would generalize? Maybe it's not just the appearance of things, Maybe it's different physical features that they might have. So what are some physical features that you could think of? Maybe their fur, maybe how they smell, DNA, you know, maybe they give off heat signatures in different ways, right? And so now we're sort of moving sideways from the physical features and thinking of what are some different areas that um, we might be able to utilize in our domain. And so now you can take one of these, let's take DNA and think like, how could we detect DNA about invasive species? Uh, you know, it seems pretty hard to tag uh, all of them, but maybe there's ways like, how do you, can we find inspirations for collecting or detecting DNA? And you might think, oh, well, you know what? There are some things that detect DNA already that are going out and collecting them. They're mosquitoes, right? And in fact, another project on the, uh, Conservation X uh, project space was a project called Swarm Sensor, which was trying to use mosquitoes as uh, camera traps, essentially, where you could collect mosquitoes and sequence the DNA and tell uh, what was happening in them. So this is just one example of how you might unlock from your initial assumptions about we need to be detecting feral cats based on uh, you know, cameras and machine vision and, uh, you know, computers and, uh, you know, things like that, and unlocking other possible ways of doing that, right? And so um, you can pick, you know, again, the, the key here is really just to explore. There's no right way to do this. Uh, there's many different levels at which you can abstract things. Here we move from photos to physical appearance to physical features. You can move back down the chain by going to fur or smell or heat instead of DNA. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways uh, to do this and, and playing with it is really the most important thing to do. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about this. I'm just gonna leave you with this. Again, there's three simple steps to unlock analogy in your own ideation, abstracting the problem, searching in other domains and collecting inspirations and applying those back to the original problem. And uh, you know, I think Tom is gonna make this available, so I won't talk about this again, but again, in this, we've talked about four simple steps that'll get you over some of the you know, sort of novice uh, humps that we've seen people fall into a lot when trying to put this into practice. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, turn it back to Tom. Thanks. Oh, well, Tom, let me actually say one last thing, which is, you know, the goal with all of this, I think, is that, you know, if you remember one thing from this, it's really that the goal is to turn inspiration from a random, very occasional process in your life, like a lightning strike, to something like a power grid, right? Can you, can you be doing this all day, all the time, um, you know, it's very fulfilling to a lot of people to be coming up with these and we need more and more people 
uh, to be doing this to solve the problems in our life. So let, let me leave you with that last message uh, and turn it back to Tom. Nikki, thank you so much. That's, uh, that's really, really incredible. The process of being able to actually go through step by step and, and go from the constraints of the solution that your mind has set up for itself and explore these other areas where you can really start to break through in some of these problems. And we've seen examples within conservation specifically of areas where analogs uh, have, have led to breakthroughs uh, and actually one of them that I'll talk about in a little bit during the Q&A was mentioned in the last webinar where they were talking about ways to control invasive species on islands. So quickly, I want to touch on where you can find out more about, about some of the things that we've talked about. And the best place to go is the Digital Makerspace, which is our online community platform for product, project work and co-collaboration. And there's a number of places within the digital makerspace, which is at conservationx.com. You can go into the challenges area where we specifically have a number of challenges around invasive species. So you can find out more about the problem and that will allow you to then apply some of the tools from this webinar into breaking down the problem and challenging some of the assumptions and then thinking about solutions and going into the abstract to find solutions from other areas. So, there's three specific invasive species challenges there, and we're always posting a lot of other challenges and in invasive species to, uh, to the Connex Tech Prize 2 page, which is uh, the, the homepage of everything to do with the prototyping grant that we're, uh, that we're running for invasive species. I'll also mention that good places to find out more about invasive species and what we're doing about them are the invasive species paper, which was done in collaboration with a number of other partners, which is a massive landscape of the different kinds of technologies that are currently being used and that we assume and, and expect will be able to be used in the future to control, eradicate, and detect invasive species, as well as emerging pathogens and invasives in the realms of transportation, agriculture, and, and human health. Another area that you can go to that I mentioned earlier is that this is a lot about the, the process of problem solving and the process of identifying what, how you approach a problem. But if you need to dive in a little bit deeper onto invasives and get a better understanding of it, you can go back to the first webinar that we conducted a few weeks ago where we talked about the ecology, we talked about the current technology being used on islands as, uh, as context, and then a lot of the other uh, innovations that could be used in the future for invasive species. Now we're gonna have 10 minutes at the end for uh, us to answer questions. Uh, I want to remind everybody that you can use that Q&A thing and this is a really great opportunity having Nikki and Alex here to be able to answer those questions live. So please do have a little think and, uh, and uh, pop a question into the Q&A section there and I'll curate them at the very end. But last thing I want to remind everybody is that the Connex Tech Prize, time is counting down. We did extend the deadline to March 20th. So you've got another week to think about your, uh, your innovations, especially with the context of this information that we've just learned. We're giving 20 teams $3,500 each to take their idea and create their first prototype. So you don't need to start with a full project plan, you can come in with this innovative idea that you have and hopefully this, uh, this process that we've just gone through will be helpful for you identifying one of those ideas. And once you develop that, submit it on the digital makerspace and submit to the Connex Tech Prize and then we'll be, doing a, uh, uh, we'll be doing this funding round right afterwards. Then after those 20 teams create their first prototype, those teams will compete to receive $20,000 as a finalist award for one grand finalist team. So submit those ideas by March 20th. You can find that all on the digital makerspace at conservationx.com slash prize.
We also have one more webinar coming up, which is a much more open office hours type webinar where we're going to sit here and answer questions that you might have about the Connex Tech Prize, about the submission process, and if you have any specific ideas or thoughts about invasive species, we'll be able to answer those as well. So if you've got a project or an idea or something that you want to ask questions on, you can join us then. That date has changed as well. That's going to be Wednesday, March 13th. So join us for that time. I'll add a registration link to the Digital Makerspace where I post the recording of this webinar. And also worth mentioning as well for the Connex Tech Prize is that we are focusing on invasive species because we want to uh, bring more innovation and attention into that realm. But we do have a blue sky category where if you can clearly state the conservation problem that your idea is solving, then we're accepting ideas to fund for the Connex Tech Prize. And that's really wide open. It's for any idea that you have that will, will make a revolutionary difference within that specific realm of conservation. Okay, so we're gonna go into some questions. So as we do this, feel free to drop in uh, questions into the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. I, uh, I'll go ahead and start off with one that, uh, that will be a little bit more invasives focused. So I want, to, um, I want to ping this over to Alex first. As we were talking about invasives last couple of weeks ago in the webinar, there was one example that they um, at Island Conservation were using where the technology that they had used to drop uh, rat poison across islands to rid and eradicate that island of rats was actually brought over from agriculture and seed spreading. And so that was an example of using an analog from a different field to solve an abstract problem within the context of invasives on islands. And so I want to ask you, Alex, what are some other areas within invasive species or within conservation writ large that you see as being really ripe for innovation with the sense of analogs and thinking about where can we look to reach into other fields and bring in and disrupt an area that is uh, that is that it hasn't changed much in, in, in the past few decades. So um, I, I I would just note we've got we also have some questions that have been posted uh, to the site as well that are really good questions. But just starting with the question that you had. Um, and I, I really like uh, Nikki's example of the camera traps. And I actually think that's a system where, you know, we have 97% of camera traps are sold to hunters and wildlife enthusiasts. And the question is, could we actually tap into this community of individuals, bring on something like AI that could detect an invasive species? And just remember, an invasive species can be a pathogen as well as you know, a, a plant or an animal uh, that we're looking at. So could you actually use that network in a novel way to do early detection? So how do we actually detect species uh, in a way using something like machine learning, machine vision to automate, but also using things like vision and sound uh, to be able to detect species uh, and to tap into a community so we can achieve leverage across a landscape that we could never achieve before. Uh, one example of where people have done this was uh, the former chief technology officer of the United States uh, was tasked with trying to figure out broadband speed of everyone's computer around the world, uh, around the United States on a block by block basis. And they were looking at doing contracting out a company to actually measure everyone's broadband speed. And they recognized it was gonna cost you know, tens of millions of dollars, take multiple years. And he came up with this idea of broadband.gov, which allows you to test the speed of your individual connection and determine whether your cable company is cheating you. And within six months, they had covered 97% of the United States on a block by block basis, just by allowing, by rethinking about how they were gonna do it and allowing individuals to capture that data. So thinking in an analogy, how could we do something similar to detect the presence of, of novel pathogens or invasives that are affecting wildlife. And that would be one of the areas that you could look at. Great, fantastic. Um, I've got a really good question here from Tristan Copley-Smith. 
She says, love the idea and the concept of analogy as innovation. Artists and highly creative thinkers seem well placed to help in this sort of, in these sorts of processes since their brains are often wired this way. What role do you see artists playing in this kind of innovation? And I think I'm putting that one to Nikki and then Alex, you can jump in if you've got any insights. Yeah, I love that question. And I absolutely think uh, that it's, you know, related to uh, innovation. So are, there's actually, I think, two answers to that question. First of all, artists themselves could certainly play a very valuable role here, um, both because they have such a diverse range of experiences compared to maybe some of the uh, scientists or engineers that might be involved in these or entrepreneurs that are involved in here. So that gives you a whole new set of, uh, you know, building blocks to use in the analogical innovation process. Uh, and artists are very used to thinking non-linearly, analogically, uh, in order to be able to, um, you know, innovate themselves in their practice. And so, uh, absolutely, I think there's there's a, a, a vital role for artists in. Um, you know, maybe thinking of extremely disruptive uh, ideas here. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, the other aspect of this is that I, there, you know, so I, I was actually at a, uh, a, a panel, a symposium on uh, cybernetic serendipity, which is, you know, is a lot of wor weird words, but um, basically meant bringing artists and scientists together to increase creativity. Uh, and this was at the National Academy of Sciences last year. You could look that up. There's some great talks from there. One of the things that uh, was really interesting to me was that uh, there's the studies of some of the most innovative scientists. So people who've won Nobel Prizes, for example. And if you look at what sets them apart, one of the things that seems quite consistent is that many of them have very accomplished artistic side. So they've taken up hobbies like sculpture or uh, painting and are quite accomplished at those uh, and keep them up even you know, at their most productive scientific years. So there seems to be this, uh, you know, this nonlinear analogical side that's often expressed through artistic practice. Uh, maybe it sharpens our, our skills and our, and our minds in doing that. Uh, that seems very related to creativity. And so, uh, you know, absolutely. I think whether you're an artist or whether you're, uh, you know, a scientist or, or, or you know, or whoever you are, there's value in practicing through uh, art and using those connections to find analogies. And actually there's uh, another really good example of the use of art within technology and within, uh, in this case, space exploration is that um, when they were, I think it was the solar panels used on satellites when they started getting larger and larger and needed larger solar panels to, uh, to actually power those satellites, they started speaking with origami masters so that they could understand better ways of folding to package those in smaller spaces to be deployed and have a larger surface area once they're actually out into uh, into the atmosphere and into orbit. So can I add a, Can I add a couple of more? I, I mean, I I think this idea of bringing in different disciplines uh, and how you mix those together is actually really what the digital makerspace that we've created was intended to do. And you know, NASA did an experiment or a competition around uh, inventing the next space glove, where you had you know biomedical engineers working alongside. Uh, dressmakers to actually develop it. The same thing was true about developing a new Ebola suit was it was where we brought engineers uh, working with health officials, working again with people in the fashion industry that we were able to develop a better suit that didn't get as heated and didn't allow for, uh, you know, uh, unexpected infections to happen around healthcare workers during the Ebola outbreak. Great, yeah, great example. Um, so I've got another question here from Zen Girl, who says, in terms of invasive species, don't you have to connect to a problem that directly affects humans in order to get traction? People really care about a dirty beach or tourism, but maybe not so much about a specific bird species. Uh, and so Alex, I'll ask you that first. Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, 
I don't think that's always the case, right? Because I think people sometimes can be um, deep, deeply uh, driven by, by uh, especially iconic species, whether that species is a snail or a snow leopard. It's, um, it, it can, the beauty and existence of that can actually um, captivate us. But the advantage with invasive species is generally they affect all aspects of human life uh, for the most part, and in fact are involved as a disruptor. So when they are wiping out things like the ohia tree, which is one of the challenges we are running uh, as well, it is you know, a, a critical cultural icon to the people of Hawaii. Um, if we are talking about invasive species, closing up uh, because zebra mussels are closing up intakes of, of power stations, so, so impeding energy generation, they're affecting us. If we're talking about invasive species affecting food security in the United States, uh, they tend to do that as well as uh, driving species extinct. So some of that connection um, can be made pretty readily. Uh, they are driving extinct many things that we care about, but I do think that there's a set of values uh, as well of the importance of biodiversity uh, that can be appealed to. And part of the way to think about it is uh, how do you use identity as a source of innovation in your tool? So I'm the kind of person who is a champion of biodiversity within what I'm doing and therefore I must, you know, I can help solve this problem uh, by, through invention. I think there's also an interesting kind of implicit assumption within there, which is that you have to have people and a lot of people know and care about it, which isn't necessarily true. If you have the idea for a very specific area that you can create a solution for, then it's really only perhaps those specific people that you need to get your solution into their hands. And that comes back to thinking about the problem and breaking it out into little individual parts challenging the assumptions that you may have about that, and then also going and speaking to your users. So if it is something that you're trying to solve that you need to have a large community of people activated and engaged in your solutions, then there are different ways to do that. And I think that one of the, a good example of that is the, is the bio blitz, which has turned into a large community effort that is almost gamified, where you have lots of schools involved, individuals within the, uh, in the public, and everybody goes out for a day and tries to effectively find as many species as they can. And those bio blitzes often will come up with new species that hadn't been seen before. That would be a very interesting potential way to, hey, we found this. Should this really be here? Oh, not really. That's a new introduced species to, to this area. So there's lots, of, uh, there's lots of different ways. This is you know, back to thinking about the problem and framing it and then what sort of behaviors you want to encourage. I have another, uh, another question, we'll do this one last, and this is from uh, Tristan Copley-Smith. His question is, does biomimicry fall into this category of analogy as innovation in your opinion, or is this different? Yeah, so uh, it absolutely does uh, to me. So biomimicry, you know, if, if by that you mean, you know, taking ideas from nature and applying them to solve our problems, um, fantastic textbook example of, uh, innovation through analogy. Uh, it's been extremely useful in the engineering um, field so much that there's actually all sorts of frameworks just around biomimicry. Um, a very practical place to look for um, things is a site called asknature.com, which has collected a bunch of inspirations of uh, biomimicry. That, that might be something you were thinking about too. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a great a uh, great place to start and also something you can do uh, just walking around the woods, which is what, um, you know, things like Velcro actually were inspired by. So, uh, yeah, tremendously powerful uh, force. Fantastic. Thanks, Nikki. And I'd really like to, uh, we can wrap up there, and I just want to thank both of you and the Human Computer Interaction Institute I really, really appreciate you both taking the time out of your day to answer these questions and to give us this walkthrough, uh, a perfect step-by-step -step process of 
uh, atomizing a problem, rethinking the assumptions, and then bringing it out into finding new and innovative and analogous solutions to some of these challenges. I encourage everybody to go to conservationx.com and learn more about the ConX Tech Prize, where you can put these things that you've learned into practice on very real invasive species problems around the world. Thank you everybody who took time out of your day to attend and hope to see you next time. If you have any further questions, we'll answer them on the Digital Makerspace after we post the recording of this webinar. Thank you all very much and have a fantastic day. Thank you.